<clears throat> in verses uh, 6 through 10. <clears throat> so let's read it before we come to the Lord's table. But without faith, Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelled in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited, for he waited <laughs> for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This is the word of Christ. Heavenly Father, help us once again. We confess. And we fall short, confess our insufficiency and our great need. Ah, but thank you, Father, for you are, you are the giver, the defender of the weak, of the needy, the shepherd of the lost. And here we are asking that you would once again supply bread from heaven. For we know that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So, Father, feed us once again, that we may be encouraged, comforted, strengthened, edified, in and through the word of Christ. For we ask you these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Folks, we have mentioned, and really quick, a little summary um, in the verses that we have already seen in verses 11, and we have said that the book of Hebrews, and particularly this chapter, gives us sort of a Christological map. What does that mean? It, it, when, when the book, the chapter repeats by faith, by faith, by faith, it is emphasizing that it is by looking to God's promise, by looking to God's promise, by looking to God's promise, which means by looking to the fulfillment of that promise in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. So it is giving us the essential of our faith, the center of our faith, which is the person and the work of Christ for us. That that is the way the elders lived. And that is the way that we now are called to live. And all of us before and now gather together in this one nation, people, kingdom, new creation that will one day be revealed in the fullness of the splendor and the glory of God's work. So we have seen a Christological map because, number one, we see his prophetic word. The prophetic word that illumines, reveals things that to the eye are not seen. We already saw that, that by faith we know of creation. We know how the worlds were made, and we know for whom they were made. The prophetic word that gives testimony to God's promise and Christ is the power that is at work in us. We have also read and testified to the priesthood of Christ when we saw Abel's offering, the blood of atonement. When we see Abel worshiping, we have this pointer to priesthood. And we said that a priest is someone that offers renders unto God, sacrifices, or consecrates. And then we spoke about how we all worship because God has provided the priesthood or the priest, the high priest, that our worship should all flow 
be filtered, go through, start from, and be directed at Christ Jesus, our priest. Because he became the offering. That we have nothing to offer as priests unless we offer Christ. And that's, we have seen that in the words also of the Apostle Paul. That we bring spiritual sacrifices through Christ. Through Christ. In other words, our worship from our own hands would always be tainted with our corruption, with our sin. In other words, if, if God would remove His righteousness from me, today in the one hour that we have been here, I have sinned a whole lot. <laughs> with words, with misintentions, with my own anger, with you know, my own lack of proper motivation. But I have a priest. <laughs> I have a priest that gave a perfect offering unto God. I have a priest that sanctify himself for me and for you as well. So that you may approach, that you may offer, that you may render unto him worship, covered, secured, sheltered, cleansed, washed, protected, accepted in the consecration of Christ. He is our priest. And then we went on and saw Enoch. And then we heard of this kingly, this kingly testimony. What do you mean by, by kingly? Well, see, if you notice, then we, we spoke of Enoch overcoming death. What does a king do? A king overcomes the enemies and secures the victory for his people. We are priests and we are kings because Christ is our great high priest and our king. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. And what does that mean to us? What that means is that he has overcome our enemies and secure a kingdom for us. The lordship of Christ, the lordship of Christ means first and foremost that Jesus has defeated the enemies. The priesthood of Christ means first and foremost that Jesus has consecrated himself. Everything now we do in terms of consecration, sanctification, surrendering, receiving the Lordship of Christ, Walking in obedience, everything is the result, the consequence of being accepted in the king and in the priest's work on our behalf. And for that, we must empty ourselves of our own priesthood and kingly ambitions. In other words, by faith means that we bring nothing in these hands of ours. But... The person and the work of Christ, his priesthood, his kingly victory. He overcame death. Who are our enemies? Well, we could mention a, a lot of enemies practically in the world, but we could sum them up in three. Death, sin, and Satan. And Jesus Christ met them in battle. And defeated them. <laughs> Praise God. And because of that, we can please God. Because of that, we can walk with God. And because of that, we shall one day be raised up to glory. And Enoch is an example of that. By faith, he walks with God at one, as one that has been set free from the enemies. How can you walk with God? Think about it. How can you walk with God? Because you have been set free from enemies, and this not of your own doing. It is the kingly work of Christ. He met them in battle, and by the sacrifice of himself, he conquered sin by becoming our sin offering. 
by the sacrifice of himself and his, and his resurrection, he conquered death by rising the third day. By the sacrifice of himself, his life, and his death, and his obedience, his perfect, sinless obedience, he defeated Satan in battle and stood faithful to the Father with godly fear. He overcame temptation where Adam failed, where Israel failed, and where you have all failed. Jesus Christ did not fail, but overcame as a triumphant king. And that is the lordship that we submit to. In other words, every time I say, I have failed, I have failed to commit, I have failed to surrender, I have failed to obey, but I have one that did not, that is the proper way of framing the lordship of Christ. Oh, we do believe in the Lordship of Christ. You betcha. The kingly victory of Christ for us that now claims me. What happens with that? And what does that do for me? For you? Well, we move on then to the reward of those who diligently seek him. When you seek Christ, your prophet, your priest, your king, his person and work for you, because that's who he is. And we have seen the glory of God in the face of Christ, full of grace and truth. We can be filled with the fullness of God, and we receive grace upon grace. John chapter 1. And receiving and living and being filled with grace upon grace. Guess what? We see our inheritance and we seek after it. We see an inheritance that is laid out before us. And the inheritance is not for you to work. How many of you have had to work for an inheritance? <clears throat> That's interesting. We, we may have had parents that say, well, I'm going to leave everything to you, so you might as well what? Work for me now, right? <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. That makes sense on the natural level. Sure, of course. But at the end of the day, an inheritance is one that worked it for you. It was one that worked it and earned it for you. And we just seek after it, pursue it, live in it, await it, rejoice, delight in it by faith. Do you know that there's an inheritance laid up for you in heaven. So that's what we hear then, and, and that's where we pick up our reading in this Christological map because this inheritance is the inheritance of sons. Who receives the inheritance? Children, right? If you're a child, you receive an inheritance. Pastor, but children can be disowned. Yes, they can, sure. In the natural, they can. But if the son is one that cannot be disowned ever, and you are attached and united to that son, can you be disowned? <laughs> because you are not the son. You are adopted sons and daughters. But who is the son? Christ Jesus. He is the son. And we're not just talking here now as the Son, just the second person of the Trinity. We're talking now about the Son of Man. We're talking about the Son of God that becomes flesh in His role as Messiah to become, you know what? The Son, the firstborn, the one with the due title to the inheritance for you. You will not inherit on the basis of your own claims, but on the claims earned for you by the Son from heaven. We see that in Hebrews. That's what Hebrews 1 opens up with. Notice, if you go back to Hebrews 1, you read there. You have all that we have just shared. Christ prophet, Christ priest, king, heir, and son for you. It's all there at the beginning. In Hebrews chapter 1, we hear... Hebrews 1, he has God, verse 2, in the last day spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed, what? Heir. 
By faith in the air, I become a joint heir. How many of you have had a co-signer? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, you're not, you, don't have any, you don't have any title to it in the sense that you didn't work for it. And you're chilling, we co-sign a car, and it's theirs, and they get to enjoy it. But who signed his blood and fortune on that dotted line? The father did. <laughs> See, the father has signed the title, the deed, to everlasting glory, immortality, and joy, and felicity, and blessing forevermore for you with the precious blood of the Lamb. What do you do now? Pastor, you do that and people are going to take to the hills and they're going to sin and they're going to become libertines. No, they haven't then seen the Father's signature. That's what happens. Because if they have seen the Father's red ink signed with the blood of Christ and they have been captured by the Father's love, they will pursue after their inheritance. They will begin to walk in the footsteps of the Son, our priest, our king, our brother, the firstborn. Notice, who being the brightness of his glow, through whom he also made the worlds, right? He made the worlds through Christ. By what? By the word of God. Christ was that word, the Logos. I was in the beginning with God and he was God. So we see Christ there as prophet and heir. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Once again, the prophetic voice of God in Christ. When he had by himself purged our sins, purged our sins. You know, he, he made an offering for purging, for purification. That is the work of who? What is the proper office for that? A priest. A priest. He, he finished. He, he purified. He purged our sins. He had, he had notice, notice the expression, he had with the help of some. He had with our help, with the help of Moses or Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, with the help of Israel. With the help of our commitment, with the help of Peter who would lay down his life for him, with the help of our surrender, with the help of our commitment, with the help of our dedication, with the help of man, not so. When he had by himself purged. What is a purge? Purges is a cleansing. It's removing all. It's taking out. It's purifying. That's how we stand before God. There has been a purge. Blessed purging of our sins by our high priest. That's what Hebrews wants to teach this Hebrew church, these Jews that have confessed Christ and that are in danger of falling away from Him. So there is no purging of sin except through the one and true high priest. There is no word of God. There is no Torah. There is no Torah without the prophetic word of God in Christ. It's about Him. It's for Him. It's through Him for you. And then he goes on to say, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, who sits in majesty and in thrones. Kings do. So here we have the role, the office of king. So this is the threefold office of Christ. This is what our reformer predecessors looked to with great um, intensity for God's people. This is one way of summarizing. This is one way of understanding Christ. This is a Christological map for you. What is Christ about? He is our prophet, our king, and our priest. And as our prophet, he sends the word that creates and recreates and redeems. He is that word. And the word of his person and work does the work of redemption. And as our king, he overcomes all our enemies, all of them. And as our priest... He earns that victory by dying and rising. 
And, and having become so much better than the angels, he has by inheritance. Notice, notice where Hebrew begins. It's not, talk, it's not talking about you, is it? No, because it's not about you. It's about Christ for you. Remember that. It's not about you. It's about God in Christ and by the power of the Spirit for you. That's what the Bible is. It is not just a book of instructions for me to check on and make sure that I got it down pat. It's not a book just of inspiration to help me live my best life now. It's not a book just of laws for me to fully surrender and commit 100% and make sure that I am now a true believer because I have surrendered fully to the Lordship of Christ because now I do everything that God tells me because I have everything from my heart. You don't even know the depth of your heart, let alone knowing that you have surrendered it all. My goodness. What we should know about the depth of our heart is that it is like a pit. That it is deceitful above all things. Pastor, but I have a new heart. Yes, and where is it? In Christ. Everything that is new for the Christian is not in you. The framing of that language, of that concept, and of that truth is your union with Christ. Pay attention to the prepositions. It's with and in and through and by Christ. Every time you just look to self and you want to talk about your own ability, your own thing, what I have, what God has given me. See, what God has given you is Christ in you. The hope of glory. That is how we should understand the faith map. Because I want to contend to you and make an argument that it is only when we have a Christological map that we can truly look at our faith map or at the anatomy of faith or the question that we have put forward in the title or why faith to please God. Mm. And it says here, further on down, verse 5 of Hebrews 1, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Verse 6, And when he again, again brings the firstborn into the world, the firstborn, who's the firstborn? It ain't you. It's Christ. He has by obedience, by right, by surrender, by commitment, by perfection, by service, by humility, by love, by sacrifice, by pouring out his life in faithfulness to the Father, earned a title to be firstborn over all creation. What is the meaning of firstborn? The one that inherits. The one with whom all of new creation rises. When we, when we are standing in glory, we're going to be looking at the firstborn of creation. And we're always going to be singing that the reason we stand in new heavens and earth. Uh, are you looking forward to that? When I rise up and see a morning like this, I just have to wonder what mornings with Christ and new creation will be like. <laughs> and if I could never see a morning again in my earthly life, we would still be sustained by the picture and the anticipation of that bright new morn that would rise one day because Christ rose from the dead. This is the kind of stuff that makes us invincible. Not because we are the champion. <laughs> Not because we are this or that. But because of who Christ is and the power of his redemption. This is what 
what dwelled to the hearts of men and women of old to bear witness, witness to this faith and live not worthy of the world. As we're going to see later on in Hebrews 11, it's going to go on to say, and all of these were not world worthy. Are you world worthy? <laughs> or have you been made Christ worthy? In other, word, in other words, fit for Christ. Fit for God. Fit for his kingdom. Fit for his inheritance. That's the work that God is doing among us and in our midst even now by the power of the preaching of Christ and him crucified for us. He is the firstborn. He is the firstborn. And then verse 10. Notice verse 10 of Hebrews 2. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. <laughs> it's a captain of our salvation. We have a Christological map here that leads us to the map of our faith. And briefly, because our time is up and we want to come to the table, I just want to give you seven points for this map of the faith. We have seen the threefold office of Christ. And I'm including there, he's the son, the heir, okay? By virtue of having finished the threefold offices. Having, having done what the first Adam should have done. What should the first Adam have done? Speak the prophetic word to Satan. Say, no, no, God has said. Get out of here, Satan. Number two, he should have consecrated himself and all that God had given him unto God in the face of that probation. He should have been a priest offering a sacrifice of obedience unto God. He should have been a priest. And then he should have, by his faithful ob obeying the word of God, in executing the office of a priest, he should have earned victory before Satan. And overcome the enemy. For you resist the devil and he will flee from you. But he failed at all three fold offices. And so did Israel. And so have you. Aren't you glad that Christ triumphed where the first Adam and Israel have failed, and he has triumphed for you. And in that reality then, by faith, what is faith? Why faith only to please God? Why faith only to please God? One, because it looks to God's character, not your own. It looks to God's character, not your own. It looks to God's faithfulness, not your faithfulness. And that's why faith pleases God. Number two, because it looks to God's gift, not your own. God's gift, not your own. God had gifts to give to uh, the, the characters that we're going to see now in Noah and in Abraham. They received gifts from God. They have received the promise. The gift ultimately was Christ. But notice, Noah received the gift of an ark for the saving of himself and his household. And Abraham received the gift of Isaac. To continue the seed, the redemptive seed. Noah received the gift of salvation so that a family would be preserved. And through that family, a godly seed. And that godly seed then is promised to Abraham. And a nation is born from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These were gifts from God. And they receive a promised land that is to be a type of the promised land that we look for that is heavenly. Because it is not in Palestine. I got news for you. Stop looking to Palestine. Your sight and your gaze is misplaced. Palestine's time and place is already past. I know, not popular. 
That's okay. I will keep on saying it until the Palestine from heaven shows up before your eyes and you will stop looking at that one. Pastor, but it's going to land on Palestine. Nope. Because Palestine will have been consumed by the fiery ordeal that shall cleanse this world. And now everywhere you go shall be called Palestine, <laughs> so to speak. It shall be called Jerusalem. It shall be called the city of the living God. It shall be called Israel. As you saying that you're replacing the Jews? No, no, I'm not replacing the Jews. I'm expanding the Jews. It's not replacement theology. It's expansion theology. Because they are not all Jews that descend from the Jews, but those who are called Israelites according to the promise. For we are all now who were before strangers, we are all now citizens of the commonwealth of Israel. Those who were far and those who were near. Because of the reconciliation of the word of the cross, we now belong in one city. God's character, God's gift, God's word. Faith pleases God because it rests on God's word, not your own. Not your proclamations, not your edict. Not your confessions, not how much you want to declare. You can declare to your blue in the face. It means nothing. The only one that declares here is God. And we declare the mighty works that God has declared and has fulfilled. That's what we declare. Yeah, go on and declare the mighty works of God. And not your mighty plans and works and expectations and ideals. That will all come to naught. But he who stands in the will of God, he who abides in him and his will. And the will is what God has finished and fulfilled in Christ. Those who abide in that will, in that rock, in that foundation will find God's provision. Which is another one of those things. Why faith pleases God because it looks not to my provision but to God's provision it looks then to God's kingdom new creation everlasting because at the end at the end of the day that is our provision what provision are you looking to I got a blessing I got a new job okay that's good But don't get so caught up in it. Don't get so caught up in your earthly material blessings. The question is if you're rejoicing in the blessing. To wrap it up, because we need to come lower stable, I'm going to ask our deacons, Armando, um, if you would come, uh, Omar, and start sitting up front, Valentin and uh, Mike, please. He would start just coming back here, actually, and just start getting things ready for when we, we um, share the elements to finish. Folks, don't, miss, don't lose sight of this fact. Notice what it says here in Hebrews, oops. In Hebrews 11, verse 10, speaking of Abraham, he waited for the city which has foundations. It's the meaning of a foundation. It's interesting, at the dawn of history, the, the dwellers of the world were called nomads, right? They would live in tents. Why? Why is that? See, living in tents is, um, is a manifestation of the precariousness of life, of the temporal nature of life. Because if the ground dries up, what do you need to do? You need to move on, right? To another place. You pick up your tent and move on elsewhere, right? If all of a sudden there's famine, or there is a, um, a climatic event, a flood or something, or an earthquake, or then you need to pick up and go. If enemies surround you, they need to escape, go elsewhere, right? So, so nomads, ten dwellers, had to be on the go and the move. They couldn't find a place to settle. 
And I'm wondering if we have found a place to settle in this world. Because we have found it too prosperous. We have found it too secure. We have found it too attractive. And we have stopped being nomads. Not so with Abraham. He knew that he was looking beyond, beyond, beyond to the city that has foundations. <laughs> Glory to God. And he looked at it with the eyes of faith. And he was coming in Christ, who is our foundation. The city with house foundations is right here. It's everywhere in the world. We have finally settled. <laughs> we can finally rest. That's why one of the characters here is Noah. And our time is up. We're going to come back to it. I wanted to move on. Will you allow me one more crack of these two characters next Sunday? <laughs> Would you? Okay. Because I want to open up some things from Noah and, uh, and see what, what the expectations were with Noah and through Noah. Because the name of Noah means rest or comfort or repose. <laughs> the world is filled with violence, with strife, with sin, with corruption. And it was the expectation and the prophetic word, I guess, from, from no one through him, that he, through him, there would be rest. And there was, but only temporal. Only temporal. But the true rest and the true repose, the true comfort, is Christ from heaven. Who says, come to me if you are heavy laden and weary. And I shall give you rest. Or as we are confessing on Wednesdays with our discipleship course, our historical catechism, what is your only comfort in life and in death? Have we begun to learn that yet? What is your only comfort in life and in death? Ah, uh, that we have a rest. That just like Noah's household was saved in union with him, we are saved from the fiery judgment to come in union with Christ. We have found repose, rest. We're more than conquerors now. We shall never again be conquered because there's no enemies to be found. The enemies have been conquered. So that now in our pilgrimage of faith, like Abraham, we're looking to the city which has... It says here, the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is, not you, God. Have you come to rest in that city? And that ark, then it's another metaphor, theme or type. We see for our baptism, our union with Christ. Peter actually says that. We're going to come back to it. The answer of a good conscience because we are secure in him. And now we can worship. We can gather. We can encourage one another in this pilgrimage. We can, we can wake up the brother and say, wake up. No, 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 don't, don't stay there. This is, we haven't arrived. It's ours. It's ahead. It's been secured. It's already come. It's been fulfilled. It's coming we're awaiting it. Come on. Raise up the feeble arms. Straighten the feeble knees. And wait on the Lord. For our redemption now is nearer. Come on. Take your comfort in Him. Rest in Him. Find your delight in Him. Because His world is passing. Bury yourself in the old men. In the death of Christ. And rise with faith. A new creation in Him. And that is the Lord's table. The Lord's table is another opportunity by which we confess our faith and by which in that confession, God is at work once again reminding you of His seal, His pledge. 
Remember we have used that metaphor? You know, when we marry, we give the vows. Is there a symbol of this covenant? Is there a symbol of this engagement? <laughs> and then the ring bearers brings the symbols. God is all into symbols. And he's given us two. Water or baptism and bread and wine. And while many churches today seem to have abandoned, perhaps neglected or confused what this is about, it is God once again speaking to you, strengthening your faith, nourishing your faith by saying, look at my pledge. Look at the sign that I have given for you. The sign of Jonah, my son, the death of my son for you, and live by faith. What does that do? It leads us to repentance. I guess it causes us to once again renounce, confess our sins, the old men, our attachments to this city, to this temporary allegiance, to the many ways that we break covenant, break commands, and are disobedient yet. We repent, we look to and turn in faith to the one who never breaks covenant, who is always faithful, who will never leave us nor forsake us, who has begun a good work in us and will be faithful to complete it. If you are in this faith in Christ, you confess Him as your Savior by faith alone, by grace alone, we invite you to the table. And the table is for you. Not just for Tamiami folks, but it's for all Christians. We want you to regularly commune at this table and be identified with this table at Tamiami. But if not here, commune with another table. It's important. It's the identification of the ark. It's the identification of Christ's body. There, the word and the sacraments and God's discipline is present. There we encourage one another and we're committed to one another in the local body of Christ. We need to have more to say on that in the future. So the table is for you. You're being called once again into this reality of the ark, of the place of fellowship with God and with one another by the sacrifice and the life of the Son. Pastor, you don't know what I'm dealing with. You don't know what I'm dealing with. Pastor, I, I have sinned, okay? So have I. The question is, do you recognize it? Do you confess it? Do you see Christ as the only answer for your sins? And do you want, again, want, you want to be renewed in Him? Say, yes, this sin is hideous. I don't want it, Pastor. Whatever it is, whatever is afflicting you, whatever is affecting you, you see it for what it is. it is. It is part of the old man. It is part of what is dying and passing. And that's no longer who you are. And you confess that you're a new creature in Christ. And you want to be renewed and receive gifts from the Father and from the Spirit in and through Christ unto that renewal. If that is you, the table is for you. If you're here and you have not been paying attention, you've been just, you know, not really minding anything that we are saying, if your mind is elsewhere, if you don't see that as now, that may have been you, but if you know now that that is not wrong, that that is wrong, that Christ is your only choice, your only answer, if you were to die tonight, you would meet the firing, consuming God, and there will not be anybody to bail you out. If you come today and you fear God, and you trust Him, and you see His mercy and kindness. The table is for you. Who is the table not for? For those that disregard it. For those that disbelieve it. For those that say, ah, I don't need Christ. I'm doing just fine. But I want religion. You know, it's okay. I just want to pretend, or I just want to pass, or, oh, this is another ritual to do because it's the right thing to do. Don't take it, please. If you think you have no need of forgiveness, of repentance, of renewal, don't take it, please. If you're here and you don't see then how in your pride, in your anger, 
in your resentment, in your sinfulness, you have isolated yourself from your neighbor and from your brothers and sisters. And then you confess and you look at neighbor and say, my goodness, what have I done? Help me, Lord. Forgive me and help me. The table is for you. But if you look to neighbor, and all you see is a reason to boast yourself that you're better than him or her, that you're in a better place to validate yourself, to boast in yourself. Don't take it. Repent. Judge yourself. Examine yourself. Discern Christ for you. And then come and sit at the table. And then those that have been baptized. If you haven't been baptized, let us know. We'll baptize you immediately, soon. That's the first sacrament in faith. And then from there to the table in which we remember our baptism in faith. Because baptism testifies to the same thing in a different way. We are united with his death and resurrection by faith. And now at the table it's we eat of his death and resurrection for us. Two metaphors, but implying and signifying the same thing. You live by faith and you hope in him by faith. And he gives you all things by faith. Amen. Let's go ahead and now share the elements.